feast of life in Latin. I started the company in the Venice Beach Farmer's Market. The idea was and is to just provide a higher quality alternative to a lot of the mass market spices and seasonings and salts. I know that your corporate name's Brown Bag Lunch. How did that come about? And you know, it's kind of like you've got Gustus, you've got Brown Bag. Are there other things under Brown Bag? I don't sound like it, but I'm originally from New Zealand. We have a family cattle ranch uh, there. We just, we do a number of things in food. So here in the States, Brown Bag Lunch, is the holding corp for Gustus Vita. We just launched a side brand of the called Bougie Barbecue, which is kind of the more barbecue focused products. So it was just kind of an ownership structure thing. How did you even come up with the idea of making spices? I mean, what, what got you into this? Mostly the eating part. I made some holiday gifts for some friends that were just some kind of flavored salts that I added some stuff to. I lived right by the farmer's market and I was working making TV commercials at the time, days a week. And the farmer's market was an idea that I was like a plausible thing I could tell my boss that I couldn't work that day because I had this thing to do and so I could make some salt and make 50 bucks and go surf in the afternoon. So that's how it started and then I was very lucky. There was a super nice lady from Whole Foods. At that time they had what was called a forager program and they'd go out and find people just like me. That's when Whole Foods Venice had just launched which was kind of their big west coast store and she was like hey this is what a barcode is and this is what a label looks like and just really was a mentor and that was our, our first account. We went from the farmer's market to Whole Foods and just kind of went there. We were very very fortunate. So you guys started out just doing salt? It was salt and salt with spices mixed in. We did and do get all of our salt uh, from the Pacific, from up north in, in Washington and Oregon. What gave you the idea to go, you know, I like food, but I want to do spices or I want to do salt. What made you go down that road? Oh, it was something that in college, it was how I got out of doing the dishes and other stuff was I would make the dishes, cooking for my partner, my, my now wife, and, and spices and seasonings and good quality sugars make a real difference. And they're a way to enhance all levels of cooking. If you're a Thomas Keller or you're someone who's trying not to die eating ramens every day. Like I said, it was gifts to family. And then it was a something that I could do. I didn't have a banana plantation in my backyard in Venice, but I could blend spices. And then it just, we were very happy to have and have now a product that is a really good plus one for other people. If you're like our cattle station in New Zealand, salt and steak or bakeware companies or whatever, we just really fit in with others and we never tried to steal the show and be the hero product. Just always be a way that everyone can enhance. What were some of the challenges that you faced when you first started going into business? We were very proud to be a little family company. My partner, uh, now wife, is our CEO. Uh, she was formerly at a, another CPG company have never given up equity to outside persons. So being self-funded and actually trying to be profitable is a pretty novel approach in any business today, but especially in food. And so I would say like our biggest challenge has been trying to manage our growth. We were very happy to pretty early on become a six figure concern and then a seven figure concern and how to do that without being reliant on outside capital or being reliant on a huge customer acquisition cost or being reliant on advertising, really trying to do it sustainably and sensibly. It was and remains a challenge. So we just, because we are self-funded and we are profitable, it means we can't be expeditious. We can't say like, we're going to South Korea or we're going to be in every single Kroger, shelf fee be damned. Or, so it's really kind of guided our, our philosophy and, and I'm, I'm proud of it, but certainly it's it's been challenging not having that pool of money. How do you maintain the quality of your product? It's a mix of being neurotic and hiring neurotic people. You know, that that is that is what we sell. You know, no one has to spend their hard-earned money on my product. And it's a product that deliberately you use on a lot of stuff. Salad dressings to sauce to your proteins to starches. And if we don't have that, you can't really hide it. Our ingredients are on the label. We don't use MSG or soy or wheat or gluten or anti-caking agents. And so we just we know that we exist because of the quality that we produce. How do you come up with the ideas for the different spice blends that you guys have. We get, you know, really helpful customer feedback and we try to kind of ape the Ben and Jerry's model of really trying a bunch of different things. And you know, sometimes some things stick, and sometimes they don't. It is very hard to predict what that is. When, you know, we have fun creating them. We just, we try and give people choice and then we let them say, yeah, this is great, or this needs more salt, or because we are a family company and we're small, we're under 20 employees, we are very flexible. How long does it take in terms of the process before you decide, okay, this is the blend that we're going to actually pack? 
while. It's, I'd say about six months. The integrity of our products is really important to us, all of the ingredients, so we know all of our suppliers. We're almost exclusively U.S. grown products. Some that we can't get here, the import, so that would be like Japanese matcha or Italian truffles. Aside from that, everything's from the U.S. It just takes time. And, you know, because we don't cheat, there isn't a ton of salt or MSG is great, but some people don't want it, so we don't use any of it, or people have allergens. It just, it takes a minute, not cheating. Well, when you have been sourcing your spices, are you going directly to the farm or are you going directly to the spice purveyor? It, it's a mixture, candidly. Okay. You know, I'd like to say that, you know, we know every single farmer in a two mile radius. In some cases that we are able to do that being in Southern California. In others, there's like larger buying groups that are a conglomeration of other farms. So it's, it's, it's a mix. A, a local one is El Aviva Farms. They have a, a pretty large orchard and something relatively unique about our products is we use a lot of dried fruit ingredients in them. Because we don't use a ton of sugar and the sugar that we do use is cane sugar, again, grown in California, we use those to kind of add complexity and depth and sweetness. They planted a bunch of cherry trees and great, we were able to come up with a product called Great Lakes Fish Fry. It's got a bunch of cherries from them. We're happy in that because we have these relationships and in a lot of cases we've grown with those companies. As they are trialing new things or testing new stuff and, and hopefully they like our products, they're like, hey, you know, we're going to try out some Meyer lemons or we're going to grow more key limes and then we'll be like yeah sure we'll buy some and we'll try it it's been really you know virtuous cycle we're very happy with it what would you consider like the most unusual herb slash spice that you thought of as something exotic it's not from california but it's, it's from hawaii just launched 30 new seasoning products in our four ounce tins and one of them is a blue spirulina and it is actually more nutritionally dense who comes up with the names for all of these different spice products? Yeah, some of them come from our, our customers so, you know they're like hey i'd really like something that kind of went along with this are a lot of our employees have been with us for over five years and are part of all of the creative process so there's only so many ways you can say like gourmet or barbecue so we've, we've certainly been through the thesaurus a number of times we're a small team there's no real hierarchy so we just kind of do you like this what do you think what does it taste like what's it good with and then we mix stuff around by focusing on quality and what people like and having a broad selection i think we have almost 400 different flavors and seasonings now and what's a non-gmo product certification um, all of our products are non-gmo we were part of the non-gmo project which is a badge that you get once you're certified non-gmo how do you define a sustainable sourcing practice by knowing all of our suppliers knowing that the products that we get from we're able to choose regenerative sources for those ingredients so an example would be arcane sugar being grown in the united states california or in hawaii we use that in place of palm sugar which is grown in the philippines and is slash and burn agriculture yeah it's primarily knowing your sources and then just making selections based on what's sustainable you guys have a few broad categories of spices from what i could see you have salt sugars single ingredient and the spice blends tell me a little bit about each of those categories all of our salt uh, comes from the pacific northwest salinated so it's ocean salt and uh, we just <laughs> we get salt and we add good stuff that we don't use anti-caking agents or any like fillers or, or whatever so it's a natural product and they're like it clumps and you're like well i mean the way we look at that is like you know if you haven't used it in four months like we're not doing our job our seasoning blends inversely have a pretty low sodium content a lot of have zero sodium so they're a little bit lighter just because they don't have that weight in terms of net and there's a variety of them we have this kind of new line of everything but burger or fried chicken or guacamole or a lot of taste of um conceit which is kind of like a different region of place and finally our sugars kind of similar to the salts they're all made from from cane sugar, again, with, with natural additives. So like if you go to you know, your local Safeway or, or Ralph's, you look in the baking section, like all the baking sugars are kind of not the best sugar. And then if they have color or flavor, blue number seven, it doesn't have to be that way. Our blueberry pie cane sugar is dehydrated cream cheese and blueberries. Now you get all of your salt from the Pacific Northwest. Do they have different types of salt? There's kind of only two types of salt. There's rock salt, which is, you know, when the sea level was higher, and then it receded and it left a bunch of salt, dig it out and it's in rock form. And then there's sea salt, which we get con the contemporary sea. There's no such thing as Himalayan pink salt because the salt, the sea level was never that high in the Himalayas. Salt mine outside Kerala in Pakistan, which produces that and it's polluted with iron. So it's rusty Pakistani coal salt. And then black salt is just has charcoal added to it. So my preference is sea salt. It, it just depends. And then you've got a whole
whole line of single ingredient spices. It's really hard to see what lands. So like our crushed red pepper flakes, I think probably because people are just used to getting them from third hand from McCormick's and a giant whatever, or their local pizza place where they've been holding up the walls for 20 years. It, it was great, people love it. It's a simple thing. We try to do the same thing with black peppers. We crush the black peppers, couldn't give it away. That's part of what we're very fortunate to be able to do is to, in our small way, to experiment and to provide that alternative. And sometimes people say, no, I don't want an alternative. The pepper in my grinder is fine. Sometimes they do. Now, how do your chili pepper flakes differ from the mass produced? A lot of it just comes down to scale and attention. Once you lose that scale and the need to have profit before everything else, you just have a lot more flexibility. Like I'm sure you've had a fresh squeezed orange juice versus something that's been in a vat in Tampa for two years. I mean, they're both OJ, they just taste different. Because we make things in small batches and we take care when we're drying them and we know what our seed to um, flake ratio is. Yeah, it's it's what I said at the top. I'm neurotic, our, our employees are neurotic and we're, we're proud of what we make. You've got this really cool container, which is really super practical. What inspired you to, to go into that route? Yeah, so it was going back to when I first as a gift, it was a stick and I just glued on little magnets to the bottom of it. And the idea was that you would see it, you know, kids support card or a photo from the trip and that by not being in the spice drawer, it just developed into something that people were like, this is great. I, you know, I can put it on a barbecue, I can put it on the microwave. And that's really our thing is that like, you don't have to get takeout. And, and if you do, and you know, you can make it a little bit better. All the tins are recyclable, but yeah, it's, it's meant to be used. What would you recommend with the shelf life would be on your spices? Once you open it, you should use it within a couple couple months. We seal everything in a little poly bag, so you have about a year. The enemies of spice are light and air, so our tins don't have either of those, which is good. But yeah, once once you open them, it will start to carry. And what's your favorite spice that you guys have? We do a French onion I use all the time. It's super versatile. That one, I use our ramen seasoning a lot. It's kind of like a togarashi. Probably those two that I lean on the most. This was a pleasure. Thank you very much for, for being so gracious.